from the heart of Dubai, where tomorrow is being built today to the world. Welcome to the CTO Show with Mehmet. Here, we redefine technology and reimagine possibilities. With Mehmet, delve into the riveting realms of AI, cybersecurity, and digital technology. Experience the thrilling highs and lows of startups. Immerse yourself in the spirit of entrepreneurship and witness the future of business innovation being written in real time. Now, without further ado, let's tune in and explore the future. Hello and welcome back to a new episode of the CTO Show with Mehmet. Today, I'm very pleased. Joining me from Canada, Francis Lacoste. Francis, thank you very much for being with me on the show today. Actually, you put your title there, the VPE coach. So <laughs> the way I like to do it is, you know, just ask my guests about, you know, their background and what they are currently up to. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Mehmet. Really happy to be here. Um, so I'm Francis Lacas. I live in Montreal and I'm now a professional executive coach with um, working mainly with CTOs and VP of engineering. Um, I help them to um, make the transition, I mean, to grow, really to grow where they're up, their org. So work with a lot with uh, scaling startup um, when the team is going, growing fast. And um, I, I really like this, 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 this challenge because this is where the, the, the culture, the future culture of the organization needs to be established and uh, the perennity where there's a little bit more um, chances that this organization will be here for a longer term. So um, that, that's really what I, what I love. Um, my background is I, I had a long career in engineering management, technical leadership, uh, did, uh, was at Salesforce and Heroku uh, and started a long time ago as a software engineer, mainly working in open source um, and the, the, init the initial cloud space. Great. And uh, again, thank you for being with me here today, Francis. You mentioned something which immediately attracted my curiosity. And to be frank with you, you know, I had, um, you know, also coaches who work with startup, startup founders uh, and even with, with CTOs. And But I like every time to hear the point of view of my guest about the challenges. And you mentioned, you know, like, especially in the transition phase from being, you know, this tiny, small, maybe they are like five or six in the uh, together yeah. and they start, yeah, to grow very fast. So they need to hire more developers. They need to hire more people, maybe even more product managers and so on. And you mentioned something about this pain that you like to help them solve it out. So, and I'm sure it's not only one pain, Francis. So I want to hear your point of view. What are like the major challenges they face when they start this journey of, you know, being, you know, I like to call it going out of the shell. So they, they yeah. were just inside the shell and now they are going out to the bigger world and they need to, to, to have a real company culture. So what are the main challenges you see? Yeah. So I, I, um, two, two challenges here. Um, I mean, there are many of them, but I would, I would, there, I would put them in two category. Um, the, the first one, and and this is um, we often don't talk about it, um, but it's the it's it's kind of the identity shift that it's kind of a more personal challenge. Um, working with CTOs or which are often like the technical co-founders, when they get out of the shell, you know, there's kind of a, a decision point. You know, who what is the role that they want? Do they want to continue to grow and then transition from uh, the product builder to the builder of the organization that builds the product, that's a very different uh, role in a way. And um, so there is, a, and with this change of role, there's often an identity shift, you know, because often we, uh, especially if you're the founder, you kind of invest usually too much of your identity in your project, in the organization. Um, and then, um, and, and if you're a technical co-founder, often your, your, your identity will be tied to uh, doing technical work, you know, building the product, making technical decisions, all of this. And as you grow, your role shift from less uh, being hands on and doing everything, making all of these calls to empowering and building their, creating the 
the larger context in which um, your vision and and your skills can can work on their own, you know, and 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 people are autonomous and and carrying it uh, forward. So this is like first challenge is identity in a way the ide- identity change that's required, and and then that manifests like in multiple facets. But I, if I had like to abstract it, this would be like the first abstraction. The second one, uh, and these are the challenge I, I put like on the the culture side. So when you're small, often there's kind of something organic. You know everyone. You've been in the trenches together, and now you're going to add um, a lot of people to it. And if you're um, your culture is not formally defined and, and, and you don't know exactly how you, what you want the organization to become, then um, when you double the size of the team, you know, if you go from 10 to 20 in, say, a year, which is not super fast, but is <laughs> still, um, you, in, within a year, you will have more people who are coming from outside the organization with different backgrounds um, that if, and and if it's, there's not like a strong center of gravity to to uh, to for them to integrate, then um, often you, you what you see is kind of a dilution of the culture. Then it becomes like much more. And, it's, and if, I mean, ten to twenty is not that bad, but you know, twenty to forty that's usually when <laughs> things starts to stretch really, and then um, uh, it, it becomes very chaotic. And and there, there's this. Uh, Yes, this feeling of integration is lost itself. So usually, the call there's like I would I work with both the personal um, challenges and the cultural um, team challenges. Now this is very interesting. You know, like you you, you divided into two categories: the identity and the culture. Now, when you work with with uh, you know with these startups who are growing very fast, Francis. There must be someone, but who should be, you know, carrying the flag to make sure that, you know, while we are growing, this flag doesn't get, you know, too much (laughs) shaken and then we we lose track. Because I believe the consequences of having this, and I heard it even from founders and technical co-founders, like the biggest thing they are scared uh, from is that, having someone from the founding team, maybe a founding engineer to leave them, right? And then because they have these changes. Now, who takes the responsibility of this? Is it like the CTO and, uh, um, you know, the technical co-founder is the CEO also should be involved in this if they are like kind of two two co-founders or more over there? There must be someone accountable for this, Francis. Who do you think usually is the right person to, to have this uh, uh, task assigned to? Yes, exactly. This is a great uh, question, Mehmet. The I'd say it's actually the realist, the, the accountability lies in the leadership team. Um, so it, it doesn't need to be one individual, but the leadership teams, which usually the startup will be the co-founders and maybe like if they hired uh, an executive uh, to join for sale or marketing or whatever, you know, what is the leadership team? That is the team which needs to own the cultural and direction of the company. And if we want to, to, to really put an, uh, someone on it, well, at the end of the day, it's the CEO's responsibility, making sure that the, the leadership team um, owns this. Now, uh, in a startup, which is very technical, I think the CTO is also kind of a key holder there because of the the, the impact of, of cultures, particularly in the, the product development sphere. But so there needs to be a champion on the leadership team, which can be the CEO, can be like the CTO, can be the, I know the, I, you need a champion on the leadership team. And at the end of the day, it's the leadership team that is responsible for the, the company, making sure the culture is strong uh, and healthy. That's why, you know, I like the, the, the flag, you know, which is, I mean, there's a, an image of the flag, and also another image I like is the North Star, um, uh-huh. you know, which is okay. Where is it? What we're adding or the, the compass? You know. Right, 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 right. So you mentioned a couple of things about leadership, and you know, while preparing uh, for the episode, I've seen a term that you use, which you call it inner game uh, for the CTO, and probably when when they have grown 
enough and they have maybe a VP for engineering. So what do you mean by the inner game? And like, is that like something that impact also, you know, the, the, the way the leadership role is, is seen and the way they, they kind of execute on the plan. And of course, culture is part of making sure like, you know, we, we stay on the same culture. We create a healthy culture for, for the team. Yeah. So the inner game, I, I come, uh, this term comes, um, I mean, what it, it, it points to is all the self-awareness, emotional intelligence, um, the set, your set of beliefs, you, this, this dynamic of who am I, you know, the identity aspects, this, these are all tied to the inner game. And um, this is super important because in a way, this is how we show up, you know, I mean, it, it, how we're going to show up as a leader is in, is in um, great part, this inner game, the development of character. And I, I, I call it the inner game, and this came from um, the, there's an initiative which is called the Inner Developmental Goals. Um, I don't know if you heard of, of it. Um, and it, this was, this started um, a couple of years ago um, when, I mean, you're probably aware of this, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, which is this UN uh, initiative about yeah. uh, what are our goals so that we, we don't, you know, we can continue to live on this planet, you know. And um, unfortunately, we have these SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, but we're not, as a planet, not necessarily, I mean, we're not working fast enough, probably, <laughs> to meet these goals. And so some people kind of uh, ask the question, okay, why, why are we, what, what is preventing us from making more progress or more rapidly on these things? And they came up with the Inner Development Goals, which are related to this inner cultivation uh, things around um, uh, you know, the intellectual skills, the emotional skills, the leadership skills needed um, so that we can work together to achieve the sustainable development game. So the inner game is, is kind of everything related to these dimensions. Um, yeah. Got it. Um, one of the things you just mentioned, which is also something I believe very important, Francis, is so, so about the emotions about, you know, the psychological effect, let's call it on, on the team while they are growing. So everyone says, yeah, working in a startup and this is not only for the founders, of course, it's for the early team as well. So it's going to be a lot of work. It's going to be a lot of pressure, especially, you know, if they, maybe they raised some funds and now they have this, uh, mandate let's say that to show the investors like we are on the right track we need to generate revenue and it's a responsibility of, of everyone which is true like i mean it's, it's not only for the sales people and the marketing people it's also part of what the engineers would be doing the part of what everyone on the technical side of the business will be doing so how important here is is to also have this you know um kind of balance between what the business needs, you know, because of course, when we say growth, it's not growth only in the number of the team. It's also growth in, in the business, revenue. right? Yeah. Revenue. So how to balance this, you know, from, from your perspective, because I know like, uh, you know, this is one of the probably uh, top of mind for, for, um, you know, the VP of engineers, engineering and the CTOs who want really to protect their teams as well, but at the same time, they need to also to, to show them the pressure that we need to de deliver on time. We need to, you know, to, to you know, fast forward the, the, the product development to, to go to market because we don't want the competition to come before us and so on and so on. So how to maintain this balance? And, you know, what are like, you know, the things usually when you work with your clients, you focus on to have this feeling of safety at the same time keeping, you know, going out full-fledged yes um so balance is always is always dynamic you know? so and and to and the the, the way i think about it uh, is um so there, there's three three aspects here i want to touch on that you you mentioned um so uh, there's the, the, the everything related to the business metrics to me, this is, um, if we focus on that, you know, if we make that like the center of our intention, 
we're kind of flying, we're kind of losing touch with what is it the organization? Because I mean, revenue, I mean, revenue is never the goal. It, I mean, it, the revenue is more kind of the, the, the gauge of how you're doing on your goal. You know, it can be a gauge of how you're doing on your goal. Because I mean, if you're revenue, I mean, when you're in business, you're not in business to make revenue. You know? I mean, you, you need revenue to, for the business to continue. But, you know, why are you doing uh, building an AI tool instead of, you know, selling windows or construction? These are all businesses. They all generate revenue. I mean, it's because probably you have like a vision, something related to that you believe in that can be a business. So in a way, the, the, the business metrics are kind of your dashboard to seeing like the car is the car running well and, and all of that. So you need to pay attention to that. But if you only pay attention to do that, that, then you miss your, I mean, you lose touch with your North Star, you know, with the flag that we talked about. Um, and, and this is, so the balance is, um, is, is not between the revenue, the business revenue and the, the, um, the fund that the company is adding. You know, the, I think the, the balance that you find for a, in a high performing organization is between the clarity of the North Star. Like, okay, this is what we're doing and this is how we're doing about it. And the, this is like the vertical, I, I, I don't know why. Because it's aligned, the North Star is in the start. That's why it's the vertical dimension. So this is one thing. And then the other aspect is the um, everything related to the working as a team, you know, working as an organization, as one team, one organization. The, these like where the values, the, if you want to put a name to it, you could put like the, the psychological safety dimension, you know, which most... Uh, uh, the, the Aristotle study at Google and then ad, others have shown that this is the highest predictor if you want of high performance in that way. If you don't have that, then uh, I mean, this even like, I like very much Patrick, uh, Patrick Lencioni and five dysfunction of a team. You know, this trust, vulnerability based trust was the, the first dysfunction. This is this dimension. So th this is very important. And once you have these two dimensions, this is how the balance is achieved. You know, that you can then read on your dashboard and the repair our revenue growing and that sort of thing. But the, the revenue is kind of the, uh, the, the, it's kind of, a, it's, I mean, all business will tell you revenue is a lagging indicator. <laughs> so it's kind of the emergent property of how, of your execution and, and how good you're at execution uh, of fi and finding this balance between where we're heading, what we think this business is about and our ability to actually work together to achieve it. You know, like, uh, couldn't agree more on, on, on this point with you, Francis. You mentioned, you know, the team and, you know, like, uh, you know, this uh, psychological safety. Now, we are currently kind of, I would say, majority of the startups accepting, you know, hybrid, remote first, right? And... When we need to convey this culture message, the emotion message, the psychological safety message. Now, back in the days, these teams, they used to be in a garage. Maybe they used to be in a, I don't know, they used to rent somewhere cheap so they can all meet together, work on, on their projects and, and their you know, uh, gigs, I would say. And it was a closed environment. So within a remote environment, and especially, you know, we talked a lot about, you know, the effects of pandemic uh, on, on the show, whether from, you know, managing the teams and whether about, you know, to, to you know, make sure that we can deliver what uh, we are aiming to deliver. But when it comes to, to these uh, points, Francis, which is like the culture, you know, letting the team feel they are comfortable, safe. How do you think, you know, and keeping this North Star, right? And I like when you say, you know, it's like vertical because it's vertical, it's a North Star. <clears throat> but the North Star, how much accurate it can stay in a very distributed team uh, assignment, let's call it this way. And how do you advise, usually, again, the startups you work with to make sure that even if they have a remote kind of maybe hybrid kind of, of uh, uh, team to still not lose the North Star we, we talked about. Yes. I mean, there's so much in, in what you in, in this question. Um, 
So one thing I didn't say when I presented myself at the beginning was um, I've been actually working remotely for over 20, almost 25 years at this point. Um, and I mean, I did mention open source. So, I mean, the free software movement back uh, in the end of the 90s, early 2000s was all over the internet. And and so, and we're working in, in companies that were in that environment, which were already remote first. Um, so a lot of experience working in a distributed environment. And and you're right, you know. Um, and and the trick. So you you mentioned the impact of COVID, and I think COVID was um, both. I mean, it was hard for the planet in so many ways. But from looking at it for the perspective of remote work. I think it was kind of, it was good. It was uh, because it kind of showed everyone that, hey, we can actually work remotely, you know, because there are a lot of people who just couldn't believe that this was possible. So, hey, we can actually be very productive without working all together in an office. And at the same time, I think it, it was kind of a, 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 it hurt remote work uh, because it gave a very skewed impression of what remote work is. And the backlash that we're seeing now about like, oh, let's return to office is kind of a, a bit in reaction to that more than to remote work. Because when I was working remotely um, before, um, working without meeting your colleagues was not how you work remotely. When I was at Canonical, we were meeting, I mean, and in most companies, we were meeting from four to two to four times or sometimes more, depending, that's getting too much but two to four times a year you know the team would meet um at, at and when they're with, with less travel could be quarterly for the planning and things like that um and and this points to there's a we're i mean as humans we are um, we know how to build closer relationship when we see people you know i mean when, not we see people but we live close to people um and at the same time, I think this is so. This is important, but there, this is not the only way, and it's it's missing actually the critical way in which we build trust with, with people. And and this was uh, I mentioned Patrick Lencioni. You know, uh, his uh, first dysfunction was the absence of trust, and the trust that he was talking about was vulnerability-based trust, which is the definition of psychological safety now. You know, kind of how the group is deemed safe for taking interpersonal risk, which is the idea that, hey, if I say something here, I know I trust this group enough that they're not to take it the wrong way and and use it against me. You know, I'm safe to uh, to take risk in a way and to be vulnerable. And um, so this is the, the active ingredient to getting people to work together. And sure, Getting to meet people in person, it 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 just kind of it's it's a catalyst. It makes things every. I mean, uh, it, it, you you meet in person and then like you get a lot of goodwill and 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 for the online after that you know, for three to six months without uh, any issue. But if you know that vulnerability is the key, you can you can and the ingredient you can you can use that to your uh, in your in your meetings and your activities to kind of tap into that and reinforce that, hey, you can be vulnerable and it's going to be uh, honored and respected and even rewarded in a way. Um, so there, this can, can be done online. If you do that both online and in person, then this is how you accelerate the trust for real. And um, to the, the clarity about the, the North Star, so it, I don't think it's about being in person or remote actually in this case. Um, what what in person allows is that for you can have conversation without the lags and like especially in big groups it might be easier to get everyone to get on the same page. But really, the north star, the clarity, comes from being clear, achieving clarity around it, and then repeating it again and again so that people know it, internalize it, and then can make. Uh, I mean. If if I have to check with the captain every time to see where the North Star is, it's, is it really a North Star? I mean, it's it's not as efficient than if I, I actually can know myself. And then when it takes time for me to take a decision as an engineer or product manager, I kind of know. I know where we're aligned as an organization. So that's the work that we do. 
Absolutely. So just out of, you know, because we repeated the, the term North Star. So communication is key, right? So everyone is on, on, on the same page, as we say. Now, any framework, because of course the most known one is the OKR, right? So like, is this usually what you advise, you know, these uh, startups to use? Or like, do you have something else? Or keeping this North Star communicated and, you know, in front of everyone, even if they are not in the office, maybe even on, they are overseas sometimes. Um, yes. So I'm, I'm kind of somebody who is, um, I'm, a, I'm actually a framework mental models, uh, collector, you know, I, I, there's a tons of them. And they're all interesting and good in their own context. So if an organization is kind of working with OKRs, then yes, okay, let's make sure that the OKRs actually are the way that you're using to communicate the North Star. Um, I mean, I come from Salesforce. Salesforce was using the V2MOM for that, which is another tool. And the, I'm actually not a big fan of either OKRs or V2MOM or anything, because I think it's often... People will focus on the mechanics and the letter and then forget what it is about. So you can have like a lot of OKRs and nobody knows really what is the North Star of the company, you know, because they're just trying, they're, they're kind of, they, they are looking at the instrument or instead of looking at the direction, you know. Um, and so, yes, OKRs, VQ moms, just a napkin with principles, cascading, our cascading priorities. These can all work. If you use them to actually communicate something that is very clear, um, and that should be like, it should it should be a one pager in a way, you know. I mean, and that, this is often what happens with OKRs is that it transforms what could be a one page into like a thirty different things, and then you kind of lose the for, the forest for the trees. Yeah. So as we say, don't overcomplicate things. Like yes. if, if, yeah. So so, so in a startup, you know, of like. 30 people, OKR, I mean, OKRs came from IBM or Intel. It was Intel, actually. You know, this is a very large corporation and the problem they're optimizing for is not a problem of a 30 people startup. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, some people, you know what happens? They see something, they read about something, they get fascinated with it and they say, hey, let's let's implement this in our organization. Yes. And and. It happens not only, you know, and with the technical teams, it might happen with the sales teams, it might happen with the marketing teams, where someone sees something on the internet, especially, you know, now, like everyone we kind of, you know, share these things. Hey, like, this is the framework I used in my company. Um, you know, we achieved 7x, uh, you know, whatever metric is for like whether sales whether like perf performance productivity and so on and everyone start to follow the same thing because they think yeah if we just copy and paste it here it will work and my opinion is always yeah i love frameworks but i would say um try to use them as a guidance not as a copy paste approach like yeah yeah cargo culting is the worst <laughs> exactly so so try to get inspiration from what other people have done using these frameworks and always you know but you know what francis and maybe this is something i want to ask you about my observation is although like maybe it's like not uh, it's contradictory with the with the context of startups but what I have seen is that people, they like to use shortcuts. And yes, we love shortcuts. <laughs> <laughs> me included. Don't get me wrong, guys. So me included. But shouldn't we, at in, in a startup culture, uh, really try to see and be creative? Don't use something which is kind of a status quo. Uh, and this is why I wanted to ask you, like in, in your work, like you, you work with founders a lot and co-founders. So I think they need always this, someone to whisper to them that guys, you need to do this. Guys, you need to do this. So this is why I wanted to ask you, like how important is always to have this coach next to you? And I know that like, coaching is different than mentoring. I had a episode about this, but I mean, how important to have this coaching, you know, uh, you know, next to them, uh, so they don't get dragged in 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 these kind of acts that might actually harm them, not help them. 
Yes. Um, I mean, I think, I mean, I'm a coach, so <laughs> obviously <laughs> this is super beneficial. <laughs> um, but I, I think the important thing here is that, um, and you said something about the frameworks and the internet is great. You know, everything is on the internet. Uh, the internet is also very problematic. Everything is on the internet. <laughs> so um, the, as co-founders or startup leaders, and I, I mean, as leaders, we all do this. We look at the internet and then we look at what others are, people, uh, are doing and we, we say, oh, they're successful. They're using this. If I use this, I'm going to be successful as well. And that's, that, that's totally, you know, th this is not sound reasoning, but this is how it goes. And um, whereas the important thing is kind of understanding, oh, okay, they've been successful. What is their definition of success, the definition that I'm interested in? What is the context they're operating in? Is this my context? So, I mean, using others as guidance, it, unless we understand really the context in which they're operating and where they're heading, then if we copy it or even like be inspired by it, um, we, we, we might not be, we're, we're, we're not going to be successful, really, you know, because uh, success comes from a deep understanding of our own context, where we're going, our own resources, and how to get there. And this is this is what a coach does, you know. And a coach is, you said, this is different than mentoring. So yeah, so in a way, I'm kind of I'm not an an advisor, I'm not a consultant. And when I work with cons, uh, this is why I said, okay, the startup is using OKR. Okay, let's I can work with OKR. This is not the, the point, you know, it kind of the, I'm not there to tell them what to do or how to do it. Um, I'm there really to help them to deepen their understanding of what is it that they're, uh, what is their business, how they want to do it, what are their, what is their goal, how are they going about it, and get clarity around that and then um, help them to get like, uh, yeah, it's kind of getting a third person, allowing you to see yourself from multiple directions and then benefit from okay, well, I, these are things you might encounter, things like that, to fuel their reflection. Um, so this is how, uh, and, and this is super important to us. You know, in a way, I think you, you don't need a coach. I don't think, I mean, you need a coach to see that that's not, uh, that would be disingenuous. Uh, I don't really believe that. Um, but what you do need is have a space where you're able to reflect and, 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 and simmer what is it that you're doing and get a perspective on it. Um, now, um, getting a coach, working with a coach is a great way to have that, to create that space you know, because you're, you're going to meet your coach on a regular basis. That, that's time in your schedule where you're going to take that and, and you're going to be invited to, to, do, to establish this even outside of that container. But this is what is really critical. The critical piece is getting a space where you're able to take a perspective on what you're doing and reflect on it, try and, 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 and adjust, you know, um, a coach can do that, you know, get be part of a, a peer group. Um, you can have like a journaling practice and, and, and each of these gives you that in a different way. So doing two or more kinds of great synergies, but the, the, the key point is really just getting, where in your life, you know, where in your profession do you take that time to reflect and, and create space around, get out of the, you know, the, the, the treadmill you know, of, of, of trying to get to the next place and kind of taking a perspective, well, am I really running in the right direction? You know, because running faster, if I'm not going in the right direction, it's not going to help. Yeah, ma makes sense also as well, Francis, to, to your point. Now, one thing you mentioned, which now it came to my mind now, You've been doing this for a long time, and just because you mentioned, like, uh, like if, if if they are building, let's say, something related to AI or something like this. Now, and you know, you've you've been yourself in in that space as well. I mean, you you were working on the other side. You've you've been like a software engineer yourself, and then you know, different. You know, you you took the ladder also. Now, what ha what's happening? today is with the AI mainly is that we are having really very fast changes that are happening that might affect even the direction of the company. Now, if we think about it from a CTO slash VP engineering perspective, do you agree with me that also this creates another layer of um, 
like pressure on them also as well to to keep you know uh, you know up to the what what the latest things are out there maybe because not only the shareholders they want to to listen like hey like we are building an ai thing we we're gonna put ai in in the application we are yes, building yeah everything everywhere <laughs> yeah but i mean also because they they feel the sad they feel like okay if we don't do this we're gonna miss out or maybe the competition gonna take out on this so how do you advise you know from leadership perspective also to have this kind of resiliency um to the fast changes that happens outside of their control like for example something like open ai releasing chat gpt all of a sudden and maybe a bunch of startups were building on top of their api and they almost became uh, obsolete right so so how to deal with such like fast dramatic um technological changes from leadership perspective yeah this is that's a very uh, interesting area of inquiry um so i'm i'm <laughs> I mean, that would be strong, but I'm kind of an AI skeptic and this is not true, but I, I'm, I'm more on the AI skepticism saves than the, 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 the you know, I, I forgot who said like the AI is going to change humanity. There will be a before and after AI, you know, kind of, uh, I think it was like, it's bigger than the invention of fire or something like that. Uh, I forgot who, it was an AI person, obviously they were, you know, selling their, their Kool-Aid, um, but the one thing for sure is that AI is probably one of these big ways that is going to disrupt the industry in the same ways that the cloud or uh, the mobile uh, change uh, the industry. And we're still at the beginning of that shift, you know, and what is how, uh, and how it's going to fall out. Um, now, this, whenever there's a turbulent times like that, um, you need to be on the lookout for what it is, you know, in your vicinity, but you also want, don't get to be too distracted because what the, what the industry will be in five years is too soon to tell, you know, and, and then you can try to find your, your way de depending on where you are in your business. But I mean, th th this is a different question. If you're, you know, pre-series A, you don't have market product market fit, or if you have product market fit, because, I mean, even if there's the cloud today, there's still, I mean, the world is big, there's a lot of niche, and it doesn't necessarily mean that your niche is going to be shattered by this new way. It might, it might not. But so in, in a way, I think the, the way to navigate is to go for, um, so ground yourself you know, as a leader, kind of, okay, yes, the, there's a lot of noise here and the, the new cycle is just spinning. And then I can try to spin with the new cycle, which is very uncomfortable, or I can kind of take a step back. Okay. What is it really that we're building here? How does, how is that related? And, 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 and go at it from that perspective, you know, so we kind of relax, don't panic, nothing's under control. That's kind of the mantra. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. Of course, like I, I say, like, you know, keep, 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 again, I come, I, maybe I repeat myself a lot, you know, like, but balance is key here. Maybe balance in a sense, like, okay, keep an eye on what's happening outside, but don't lose track of what you have built already. And, yeah, you know, exactly. You know. Yeah. And again, maybe I'm repeating myself and I'm repeating the words of, of my guests also as well. Like, the whole startup thing, you know, it's about, you know, being lean and, you know, try and pivot and, you know, see what the market really needs. And then based on that, take a decision. Don't rush up things very fast and don't wait too much until you react also as well. So maybe I'm repeating again myself. And what you mentioned, you know, I like this mantra. Like it's, it's, it's a spot on, I would say, Francis. Um like as we are almost coming to an end, Francis. Like any final things you want to share with, you know, CTOs, VP of engineering, who are on the verge of growing up, and also this is a question I ask all the time: where people can find more about you and get connected. Yes. Um, so, and if you're about to grow, I think the first thing to I, I would advise um, the leaders there is. Do you know, I mean, do you have a clear idea of what is your organization about and how you want to do about it? You know, 
because that that is uh, that that's kind of the kernel which at, around which the you'll be able to grow. If that's not clear, then the growth is going to be a little bit you know wobbly <laughs> in the best of case. <laughs> um, so get clarity on that. And um, I, I love working with uh, uh, with people who wants to grapple with these questions and and work for that. And the best way to reach me is actually on LinkedIn. Uh, Francis Eka is a VP coach on LinkedIn. Uh, or, I mean, I have a website, the VP.coach, but really LinkedIn uh, is great because, and I love having conversations with folks. So don't, don't, don't hesitate to contact me on, on LinkedIn. Sure. Great. Thank you very much, Francis. For the audience, don't worry, you will find the links in the show notes so you don't have to search and, you know, repeat. Thank you. <laughs> so the, everything will be in the show notes. You can go and connect with Francis and you can visit the website also as well. Uh, again, Francis, uh, you know, this is one of the episodes, you know, like uh, I think I hope, you know, people loved it because I love the conversation. Uh, anything Thank that you. touches, anything that touches growth culture is close to my heart because I know like this is sometime is what makes or you know, don't make, you know, the yes. startup, yeah. right? So, so it's, it's a key over there, culture, culture, culture. I repeat that, yes, product is important, but culture is more important. And I have a theory, Francis, if if you have a healthy culture, so you have healthy uh, teammates with you, and then you're going to have healthy relationship with your customers. So it's like kind of a yes. circle that completes each other. So thank you very much for sharing these insights. It was a great um, conversation, Matt. Thank you very much. Thank you for you. And this is how usually I end also my my episodes. This is for the audience. If you just uh, discovered this podcast by luck, thank you for passing by. If you like it, please subscribe and share it with your friends and colleagues. And if you are one of the people who keeps coming, the loyal followers uh, who keep sending me their suggestions and comments, please keep them coming also as well. I read all of them. And as I say always, thank you very much for tuning in. We'll be again very soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hit that subscribe button, share the show with your tech-savvy friends and fellow entrepreneurs, and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. Your support means the world to us.